a change of power in our lives is something that happens all the time, but it also brings a lot of questions. You're at a company and all of a sudden there's a new CEO. You're at a company and it's bought out by another company. You know, and obviously the question is, what is, our, what is my future? Do I have a job? Uh, where is this company going to go? And these are always the questions whenever there's a new leadership. There's an interesting story about Walt Disney World almost wasn't built because Walt Disney had died just before the construction was about to start. And the question was, do they continue the project? And after much discussion, eventually the board of directors said, yes, we do continue the project. But there was that change of leadership asking that question. We also know that when Pope John Paul II died, then all of a sudden everyone is looking at who will be the new leader and where he's, is he going to lead us. And of course, the secular world starts saying, this is going to be conservative, liberal, where are we going? Whereas the Catholic world is turning around and saying, is this person going to lead us to greater holiness? And that's always what we're looking for in the new Pope, Benedict XVI now. When we look at all that, we realize that our call as people of faith is to understand today's change of leadership. So what we see in the Gospels, in this change of leadership in today's Gospel, we see that John has been removed from the scene. He's been arrested and now he's in prison. And of course Jesus is now on the scene. Now on the surface what you see is just a change of preachers. But in reality what's happening is the old order is now ending and the new order has come. The kingdom of God is no longer in its formational years the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here. And so Jesus comes and manifests it through the healings he does. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He casts out demons. Now you have to understand this within context. When we're talking about this healing, healing represents people being um, no longer powerless to the forces of nature in a sense. You know, you had people who were suffering from a disease Diseases today that may be easily treatable. Recently, I was at the doctor because I'm just getting at the end of an bronchi episode of bronchitis slash pneumonia. And the doctor said, you're right on that line. You're right on that line between bronchitis and pneumonia. And he says, I think you're on the bronchitis side. And he, um, he gave me some antibiotics. And he said, a person my age never, doesn't have to worry about dying of pneumonia today. Well, that wasn't the case back then. Back then, a person could get a cut on their finger and lose their limb over time because of infection. All the things that we have today, they didn't have. And so they were really powerless to many forces in the world. And not only the natural forces, then the political forces. Jesus comes along and tips that apple cart, tips that power. And he comes and empowers them. And he empowers them by talking about the fact that they're part of the kingdom of God. Now all of a sudden they're part of a new kingdom. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom is in their midst. And to be part of that kingdom, power has changed now. And so we have the political power, but we have the kingly power. One of my favorite stories is the case of a man who was being tortured in a prison by an atheistic regime. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this torture, he started laughing. And they were going, what are you laughing at? He says, you don't get it. You can do this to me, but we still won because the war is over. We're just in cleanup. And he's talking about the war between Christianity and secularism. God won. And so when we look at that and we understand that the kingdom of God is at hand and the Lord asks us to be part of that kingdom, and that means to go out and transform and teach others through the hope that Christ gives us in the kingdom of God. And so we're called to bring that hope. We're called to lead people to come to know the truth. We're called to empower people to be alive in Christ that they may know that in him they have eternal life. There was a story recently, or a story I like to tell, a true story of a man who was in prison. And uh, when I met him in prison, he told me he was focusing on eternal life. He had followed up his first life. He was in prison for life. He says, so... I'm actually focusing on realizing that I fouled up this life. Now, I don't want to follow up the next one. And so he's focusing on eternal life. He started to have a hope in a world that is virtually hopeless because he knew that he could be part of the kingdom of God. That's our call to teach people that. And we teach people that by living our life, by doing things, especially the corporal and spiritual works of mercy.
Dorothy Day used to teach that. Peter Morin used to teach that. The corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which I'm, <clears throat> as you see, you're scrolling by as uh, I'm, I'm talking here. And these corporal and spiritual works of mercy are ways that we start treating people who have no hope or treating people who are seeking hope and let them come to know there is hope in Christ. And so we see this power, this power transforms people, this power, power leads people to have hope. You know, we're living in an election cycle right now where people are saying, well, let's get, get this time for change and be the change that you want to be. You know, that's all secular gobbledygook, right? Because none of these people can ultimately give you any hope the way Christ can give you hope. And that's what he's calling us to believe. And that's what he's calling us to know. And that's what he's calling us to act on. Believe. The kingdom of God is at hand and act on it. God bless you.